So now I'm going to uh, introduce Chris Budd, uh, and then we will hear from Chris uh, for the first session. So Chris was awarded the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2015 for services to science and maths education. He's a fellow of the IMA and a professor of applied maths at the University of Bath, and is interested in industrial applied maths, environmental science, and anything non-linear. He's also a passionate enthusiast for communicating maths, and as such is the Gresham Professor of Geometry. When not doing maths, he likes to walking in the mountains with his dog. Take it away, Chris. Well, thanks, Martin. And uh, um, hello, everybody, um, for this wonderful uh, series of talks uh, that the IMA has organised. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, VCHEMS, which stands for the Virtual Forum for Knowledge Exchange in the Mathematical Sciences. And I'd like to say this is very much a joint talk with uh, input from many people, but in particular um, with input from Matt Butchers at the Knowledge Transfer Network. And you'll meet Matt, uh, at least in picture form, uh, soon enough. So the context of my talk, as I'll, I'll tell you a bit about uh, VCAMS, its background, and its philosophy. And um, then I will um, tell you about some examples of the work that VCAMS has done. And we are actually gonna have some uh, proper mathematical examples to get our teeth into there. And then I'll talk a bit about where I see uh, VCAMS going in the future. Uh, by the future, I'm thinking of the next few months. And most importantly, uh, I want to talk about how all of us um, can get involved uh, with knowledge exchange in the mathematical sciences. So why does VCAMS exist? Well, at the point of a lockdown, uh, which was, oh gosh, it seems an eternity ago, but uh, I suppose the middle of March this year, a group of us who were engaged in knowledge exchange um, decided to get together virtually, of course, to think of ways that the knowledge exchange in mathematics could continue in the lockdown world. And one of the things that we were very aware of was that knowledge exchange in maths is a people-based activity. Um, it thrives on face-to-face -face interactions. And the question is whether we could continue to do face-to-face um, -face interactive um, knowledge exchange in a virtual, the virtual world that lockdown has forced upon us. So this is why VCAMS was, was set up and it, it had kind of two objectives. One was how to continue, as it were, business as normal, the, the business of mathematicians engaging with industry, with end users, with policy makers, and indeed with people in other disciplines to face the challenges that our society exists, uh, has, but also the very immediate question of whether mathematicians could help into uh, tackling problems coming out of COVID. Um, so not just problems to do with say epidemiology, because there's some very, very good people modeling those, but also the other problems that we're seeing on the economy, on transport, um, and the business of returning to work and coming out of lockdown. So that's why VCAMS was set up. And I think it's fair to say that we've all been really rather surprised at how effective um, knowledge exchange can be done uh, in the virtual world. And really, um, an enormous amount can be achieved. And I want to tell you about what, what has been achieved since lockdown. And as I say, um, what lessons we can learn that we can carry on in uh, a post-COVID world. So just to show who's involved, uh, this is what I would loosely describe as the executive team uh, that is pushing VCAMS forward. Um, I hope you can see we're, we're a nice diverse bunch. And what is um, also nice is that there are extremely strong links um, here with uh, the IMA. So the uh, idea when setting up VCAMS was that we would build it on the foundation of kind of national institutions. So David Abrahams is the, the director of the um, Isaac Newton Institute. 
Um, Dawn Wosley is Chief Executive for the um, ICMS um, in Edinburgh. And Matt Butchers is, I'm not quite sure what his precise title is, but one of the key people in the, the Knowledge Transfer Network, um, which is part of the um, uh, Department of Business, Edu uh, Industry and Skills. Um, and alongside that, uh, a number of uh, universities got involved. So uh, Caroline and I, um, Ang and I at the University of Bath, um, and Alan Champney is at the University of Bristol, uh, Rebecca Hoyle um, is at Southampton, uh, Joe Jordan is a freelance uh, researcher in industrial maths, uh, and Jane is at the INI, and so is Claire. Uh, and in terms of links with the IMI, IMA, uh, David used to be president, I used to be vice president of communication, um, Alan Champney uh, writes the regular Westward Ho column, and David, um, myself, um, Alan and Rebecca, we're all on the IMA Research Committee. So I think we can say that BCAMS has extremely strong links already with the IMA, um, but I hope we can see ways of uh, developing those um, on, um, and this talk is part of that. So that's the, the executive team. But of course, the great thing about the virtual world is that you can get everyone involved almost instantly. Uh, all you have to do to attend a VCAMS meeting is turn on your computer and switch over to Zoom. And uh, the uh, uh, blue markers here show um, all of the uh, um, institutions, uh, universities that have been involved with VCAMS activities uh, since we started. Um, and the red marker is showing where the KTN is. Um, I should say that this is just a snapshot of the entire world um, and that we've had delegates uh, coming into VCAMS activities from every single continent in the world um, and believe it or not that even includes Antarctica. Uh, we had somebody from the British Antarctic Survey beaming in. Um, so it's, it's a super inclusive world, the virtual world that we're in and I think one of the great lessons of lockdown is uh, the virtual world makes it much much easier to organize uh, big international events at zero cost and zero carbon and, and I think this is a wonderful lesson for us all to learn it's a real positive um, of the um, uh, Covid situation. Okay so what is the philosophy behind uh, uh, VCAMS? Well basically uh, it, it has kind of three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is business continuity and this is what I said, uh, the world of industry, engineering and business carries on despite COVID. Um, it still requires mathematical backup. Um, there's um, an estimate that 70% of all UK business requires some sort of mathematical support. And uh, the first pillar of VCAMS was to continue with knowledge um, exchange support through the, through the lockdown period. Um, and that involves triage, so looking at um, industrial problems which mathematicians can work on, and also uh, identifying mathematicians to go out and solve those problems. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is to be a, an agile um, way of responding to emerging threats. And of course, the big threat of all time, essentially, at the moment, is the COVID threat. threat. And uh, VCAMS very much is a way of um, kind of sending mathematicians to war against COVID in a, a really powerful collaborative way to use the skills that we've been developing for many years in knowledge exchange but to focus those against in the fight against COVID. And I should say that there are other bodies such as the RAMP body from the Royal Society that's doing the same thing and VCAMS and RAMP are working extremely closely together and will do so um, into the future as well. Um, the third aspect of the work of VCAMS is simply to add a resource to the community. So if someone wants to organise a webinar or a, um, a meeting such as the Big Ideas meeting that uh, was on last week, um, then um, VCAMS can do that and provide connectivity um, both within mathematical sciences and beyond, and also add value to that. And uh, a lot of kind of the online support has come either from the ICMS or from the INI, and they've done an absolutely brilliant job in doing that. So that's the VCAMS philosophy. And 
um, for the situation, for the COVID kind of situation, um, a lot of the, this has relied on huge voluntary pro, pro bono work from mathematicians who want to kind of do their bit to help out in this difficult situation. So uh, there are basically three mechanisms uh, that VCAMS has uh, developed uh, to uh, help. Um, the first is the uh, kind of fundamental mechanism we're all used to um, of uh, running uh, seminars or webinars or meetings um, of, of various types. And as I said, the, the big ideas meeting last week um, was an exactly an example of that. Um, the second, which I'll talk about in, in significant detail, is the running of virtual study groups. Um, and the third is the notion of triage, so that um, particularly through the knowledge transfer network, uh, businesses are coming up with problems that uh, mathematicians can have a look at, and uh, the, the VCAMS has been uh, effective in providing that um, mechanism for bringing problems to mathematicians or mathematicians to problems. Um, so as an example of a, a resource for the community, uh, since pretty well since lockdown, there's been a weekly seminar uh, coming out of uh, its joint between Nottingham and Warwick um, on the decontamination of surfaces and VCAMS has sort of facilitated that. And one of the, the nice things about that is that in a typical seminar, you might get, I don't know, 20, 20 people come. Uh, if you do it virtually, 200 people come. It's, it's just a, a whole order of magnitude more effective um, in doing things, um, in communicating. Um, so, as I say, uh, I want to talk about virtual uh, study groups. So, some of you may not be familiar with the study group philosophy, but around about 50 years ago in Oxford, um, the idea of the study group was kind of come up with. Um, a study group is a team of mathematicians that work together for a week on industrial problems. So a group of industrialists would present problems on the first day of that week. Uh, the mathematicians would then go into uh, self-selecting teams. Uh, they would work on the problems under significant time pressures during the week and on the final day would give presentations to the industrialists. Um, shortly after that they would then write a report. So it kind of the idea behind the virtual study group was to take this this idea which has worked extremely successfully for uh, 50 years and to see whether it could be run in a virtual environment. The idea being that the industrialists or, or whatever uh, would bring problems uh, which would then be uh, uh, explained on the first day uh, and then the teams of mathematicians would be um, put together in Zoom using uh, the kind of Zoom facilities and breakout rooms, work together um, in a virtual way and again report at the end. And one of the key ideas behind doing this was not just to continue with the study groups in their kind of normal way, but to have very focused virtual study groups uh, which could address problems directly related to the COVID um, situation. And uh, what you can see on the screen is uh, an example just of a virtual study group in operation uh, with, um, well, as you say, loads of interesting people, uh, some of whom are industrialists, some of whom are not, and uh, a typical virtual study group would have around about 50 people come and the problems that come um, depend upon the, the study group itself. Um, I'd like to basically say that this idea that we came, kind of up, with, came up with has succeeded beyond everyone's expectations uh, in terms of the effectiveness of the problem solving and the, the way it is engaged, not only mathematicians, but also uh, people from many other disciplines, um, industrialists, and of course, everyone who is interested in solving problems related to COVID. It's been very, very exciting and has set the scene for uh, future virtual activity um, after the COVID uh, uh, lockdown has finished. Um, so what um, happens, what, what, what um, has VCAMS done? Well, to the way the 
virtual study group works is that uh, you liaise first of all with end users that could be industry or it could be uh, people very directly involved with with covid um, the problems then go through a triage where uh, before the study group starts uh, you you have a kind of look through them and work them up into a point where uh, a mathematical team could start to address them um, there is then a pool of what we call problem facilitators that are experienced uh, mathematicians used to working in the kind of virtual team world um, of the virtual study group. Um, VCAMS then sets up uh, the kind of registration and participation and then actually chairs the event. Um, if you are interested in running a virtual study group, uh, we've also, well, um, I was the lead author, but um, many others contributed, have written an operations manual, which you can see on the left, and you can just download this from the VCAMS website. Um, and this operations manual is, is now being used around the world for running um, similar virtual study groups in, in places like America, Canada, and even India. Okay, um, alongside the development of kind of the kind of problem solving uh, facilities, uh, we've also worked up uh, a series of tools uh, for, to facilitate. So one of the big questions everyone asks when you talking about collaborative mathematics is how do you collaborate mathematically uh, 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 virtually when you know we're all used to s sitting around a, 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 a whiteboard or blackboard or a piece of paper and uh, doing ideas sharing ideas and uh, uh, we've been using a, a ton of different um, software tools uh, to um, facilitate this uh, my own favorite being HackMD which is a, a, a markdown version of LaTeX which is a beautifully simple way of communicating mathematics. Um, Mural is used for team working. Um, um, we've got electronic whiteboards, Overly for writing reports, and Zoom, everything hangs off the wonderful tools that Zoom has provided. Um, as a nice spin off from this, the techniques for virtual work team working that uh, VCAMS has been using go straight over to university teaching. So if you want to run tutorials, or uh, lab sessions or modeling camps uh, then these same tools work um, really very well in that context. Um, so here is a list of uh, the things that VCAMS has done since April and it's really been rather a lot. The, the, um, the first virtual study group was uh, run just after Easter um, with two industrial companies mainly to show see whether the software will work, whether the uh, companies could interact with the mathematicians and also to provide a bit of business continuity and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the week after that we ran the second virtual study group and this was the first one uh, specifically targeted at Covid and it ran on the question of how one unlocks the workforce and it was working on problems that were brought to it by the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, then there, have been, there was a series of follow-up meetings with that, including uh, you know, one with SPIM. I'm very, very pleased to say that the reports from these study groups have got all the way up to SAGE and are hopefully being of some use to SAGE in the process. Um, then uh, ran some webinars and seminars on decontamination. Um, then the next virtual study group was on unlocking higher education and that was followed by uh, the questions of how uh, the food logistics worked in the problem you know, in the Covid uh, situation and those have all had various follow-up meetings including one we had this week again with Aspire but also the Department for Education there's one next week and uh, last week there was a, a one week uh, normal as it were study group with industry and that had about 110 people come to it and eight problems and it worked extremely smoothly and that was actually organized by the University of Leeds um, but VCAMS basically facilitated it. So that's a pretty large amount of activity. Typically we would run one study group a year, we've run five since lockdown. Um, because of the virtual world has no inertia and very very few costs involved. So that's kind of uh, the kind of general background. Um, I thought I might tell you now a little bit about 
some of the uh, science that's being done um, in these virtual study groups. So the first one that was run, uh, the pilot, was, I say, just after Easter. And we uh, had two companies come to that. And we kicked it off with uh, problems which are kind of business continuity, mainly because we kind of knew what we were doing there. And we thought we kind of work out what we were doing on problems where we had some idea what we were doing before we threw ourselves into the COVID world. And two problems were brought, one by a company called Scott Barder that makes glue and their problem was modeling the stability of multi-flase resins. Um, and the second was by a company called Xenotech that develops uh, scientific computing software. And their problem, which was the one I actually personally worked on, was to do with radial basis functions at large scale. So I'll just sort of tell you about that and uh, show you how it works. Um, the, the problem that uh, they were facing was that you have a geometry which might be something like a, a wing with a flap uh, indicated by, I'll just sort of see if I can indicate, there we go, and there the, the kind of level shaped region and the uh, rectangular region. Um, and you might have some sort of computational mesh. And then you might want to move the, the flap with rela in relation to the, uh, the wing. And as you move that, um, you, you want to kind of change the computational mesh that you're using. But because your geometries are horrible and everything is in 3D, that's very, very expensive to do. Um, and the technique that was um, being used by the company um, was to uh, use a radial basis function interpolant. Um, and this is the mesh that uh, the radial basis function interpolant produced. And I'm sure you can see it's quite distorted. There's lots of uh, narrow regions. Um, and the plate, uh, the rectangular plate, has changed actually from being a rectangle to being a rectangle with a wobble on it. Um, and none of that was particularly satisfactory. So this was the problem they brought. And the question was, could we find an improved way of them doing their calculations? So the team that worked on this, so, so we had the two problems in the virtual study group. Um, it was a team which I acted as the facilitator for. But the team actually uh, had about 10 people in it from a number of universities and the majority of the people in it were PhD students. And the PhD students were fantastic. They, they quickly got their heads around all of the kind of technology that was required and very much, uh, well, ran the show really. They, they were absolutely brilliant. And the, the problem got uh, was solved. Um, in the sense that uh, we were able to come up with a rather better and faster algorithm. Uh, in fact, we used uh, an algorithm called the Winslow algorithm. Um, and this is a calculation that was done during the course of the, of the workshop. Um, and uh, it shows that uh, you can generate a mesh which moves with the, the uh, plates uh, and looks much, much smoother and can be done actually as cheaply, often if not more cheaply, than the radial basis function. So that was a great success. Um, during the course of the study group, the Department for Health and Social Care actually contacted uh, David Abrahams and said, we got these problems, what are you going to do about them? And a third problem sort of dumped itself on the study group and we allocated resource to have a quick look at that, uh, wrote a quick report and DHSC said, that looks great. Let's, um, could you run a proper study group on our problems? Um, and that led to the second study group, um, which uh, was on the subject of unlocking the workplace. Um, what the DHSC was basically saying is lockdown is going to ease off. Um, how should people uh, return to the workplace um, safely? And what mechanisms can you we put into place to um, make this happen? So this is very much focused on, on COVID. And we put the virtual study group together in a week. And one of the features about the virtual study group was that whilst most of the attendees were mathematicians, um, there were a significant number of social scientists and economists uh, that came along as well. And I say this were, these were all recruited 
just in, in one week. It, it was put together extremely fast. And, uh, the uh, study group divided itself into uh, four groups. So I think about 60 people came. So each group had about 15 in it uh, with the idea of looking at four different scenarios uh, for uh, the workplace. Um, so I'll explain what these are. A closed workplace is where the people in it know each other and in interact with each other. So an example of that would be an office or a care home or possibly a university. Um, and long means that they're close with each other for a long time. So that again would be an office or a care home. Um, um, and short would be they're with their cells for a short time. Um, open means that you have a group of people that wouldn't um, usually know each other, um, but still may be together with each other uh, for, uh, well, yeah, who wouldn't know each other um, and would be drawn from a fairly random population. And, and you have the case of uh, either long interactions or short. Um, so a short interaction might be, be someone um, in a shop um, and, and long and open might conceivably be something like in a theatre or um, uh, maybe on, on some sort of, of public transport, uh, like a train or, or something like that. So the, <coughs> these were the four groups that were put together. Um, I was in the short and open group, uh, which very rapidly became called the supermarket group. Um, because it was felt that the, the archetypal um, time when people who don't know each other interact with each other for a short period of time um, is when you go shopping. Um, and of course, um, shopping is something rather relevant. So it was felt relevant to uh, focus um, attention on that. So uh, during the week, uh, that's what we then did. So give you a sort of flavour. Um, of the sort of issues and of course these are issues we are very very much facing at the moment. Um, shopping involves a lot of short interactions with an open group of people and uh, there are two aspects of that. One is uh, when you move around in the shop and go and buy things um, which would typically happen in a supermarket um, and then when you've done that uh, you then queue to be served and uh, you might have some sort of shops where you queue to be served anyway, um, such as uh, a takeaway or Starbucks or something like that. Um, and various general principles came out of this. One was that um, it was time of interaction, which was more important than contact. So that needed to be minim minimized. And something which came directly out of that, which of course is now being implemented big time, is in a shopping environment, uh, it's really very, very important to have PPE and additional pr protection. Um, so just to say the philosophy of the, the second study group was to try take various scenarios of the post lockdown and test them to destruction using mathematical modeling as much as we could, um, bearing in mind all of the uh, inaccuracies and approximations that you have to do with mathematical modeling. Um, so a bit of science in this. Um, when we, we looked at uh, shoppers, uh, we looked at a scenario where uh, there were N people shopping, M of whom would be infected. Um, you could model dosage received by um, a uh, function of how far away you are from people um, and also uh, the time you spend close to each other. And all of this gives you a probability um, of infection. And this allows you to then work out critical distances um, such that as you move past each other quickly in the shopping crowd, um, things are either dangerous or safe. Um, and the results were actually of the mathematical modelling was slightly counterintuitive. Um, it turns out that a reasonable model for dosage is uh, one over R cubed uh, because of the way uh, the viral particles move around. Uh, it's not one over R squared. Um, and if you do one over R cubed, uh, look at the bottom left, you get gra uh, graphs there. And basically above that, um, it's, it's safer to uh, move past. Um, below that, it's safer to stand nearby. Um, and it turns out that uh, it's much safer to pass someone closely um, 
but quickly than to stand nearby someone even if you're two meters away. So government guidelines on keeping two meters or even one meter away are a little bit oversimplistic and you can be nearer to people if you move past them quickly and staying, it's staying close to people that's, that can be dangerous um, for a long time. And that came directly out of the modeling and that will feed through into the next study group, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, we also did some uh, modeling of the crowd in the supermarket using um, uh, an agent-based model, um, using both R squared and R cubed. And um, it turned out from that that methods of guiding people around shops with arrows so you follow the same sort of path actually turn out to be more dangerous uh, in terms of the infection that you get than allowing people to move freely around. Uh, and that again came directly out of the modelling. Uh, just to say where this is going, uh, so the work of the study group has now been written up as a preprint, which has been submitted to the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And I've also um, now working with people, uh, I've sent the same uh, thing to people in Morrison's, and um, this has also led to a UKRI grant uh, application, which will hopefully take all this work on uh, in a much bigger sense, getting proper data from supermarkets and looking much more deeply into the science. So that was the second study group. Um, and then that naturally led on to uh, the third virtual study group, which was the process of um, how we unlock higher education. And some of the principles that we developed in the uh, second study group could then be applied directly to this. So the third study group involved uh, mathematicians again, uh, chief operating officers from universities, uh, people doing timetabling at universities, uh, and also uh, it had social scientists, and I'm pleased to say a number of, of students came along as well so that we could uh, uh, understand the student experience aspects. Um, so this was the third study group. Um, and that was, when was that? That was towards the, uh, that was from the middle to end of June. Um, and that study group, again, uh, divided itself up into uh, three different problems. Uh, problem A was trying to understand uh, what the dangers to uh, uh, people come from the actual process of teaching in, in a lecture theatre. Uh, the second is the uh, issues that to arise uh, in a campus and moving around in a campus. And thirdly, the issues um, of how the university interacts with its local community and also with its global community. Um, what I'm going to show you are a few slides which were produced by Nick Holliman, who's Professor of Visualisation at Newcastle, that took the report that was generated by the virtual study group uh, and turned it into a very nice uh, visual presentation. Um, and this is the presentation that we gave to uh, Spy M and the Department for Education uh, on Tuesday of this week. Um, with, of course, the caveat that you always have to have with all mathematical modelling um, that all mathematicals are wrong, it's just that some of them are useful. Or to be more precise, um, none of this has been properly tested against data, so uh, it has enormous caveats as a result. And that has to be true of all mathematical modeling, especially at the moment. Um, again, just a bit of science. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, but the, the question that the group uh, looked at was if you have a certain number of hours um, of teaching face-to-face, uh, -face, um, which some universities are doing two hours, some are doing three, my own university at Bath is doing four, um, what is the, the safest way to deliver that in a kind of tutorial type scenario uh, within a lecture theatre? And there's some very nice uh, fluid mechanics, uh, you know, what I call traditional applied mathematics, uh, that you can use to do this, um, where you look at how aerosols spread around at a certain time and how people then get infected. And uh, various conclusions came out of that. Basically, the shorter the lecture, the better, uh, if you've got low levels of talking. Uh, but if you've got higher levels of talking, um, there's a bit of a compromise. And that kind of came out nicely from, from the modelling. 
and the, these models have been presented to a number of universities uh, to help guide uh, times of lectures. Um, another bit of modelling we did and we had a, a, a team of experts come to talk more about contamination about this um, was how uh, often you should clean and the effectiveness of cleaning um, and if you are getting contamination on surfaces what is the best length of lecture and interestingly enough um, if you've got surface contamination it pays to have longer lectures rather than shorter ones um, because it minimizes the chance of cross um, group con uh, infection um, if your cleaning strategy isn't as effective as you'd like and again that came out of the modeling um, and the third piece of modeling we did was movement to lecture theatres as people are quite concerned about this um, but what's interesting is that the the work that came out of the second study group of supermarket modeling and people moving quickly past each other shows that it's actually pretty safe um, for people to walk past each other in corridors the chance of infection is is very very low the only real problems is when you get bottlenecks um, and you can do agent-based modeling of students going into a lecture theater through that and we did some of that um, but given that lecture theaters are going to have between 10 and 20 percent occupancy uh, in, in the kind of new regime um, actually a lecture theater designed for uh, uh, say 200 students you can get 20 students in very very quickly and so moving between lecture theaters turns out not to be a problem so, so these results um, are being, and, and the, the other groups looked at bubbling um, issues and public transport and so on, um, were presented to uh, DFE and uh, SAGE uh, on Tuesday, and there's going to be a follow-up meeting to this next Tuesday, um, if anyone's interested in, in coming along. So that was the third study group, um, and then after that, uh, a couple of weeks after that was a, a fourth one which um, I wasn't able to attend due to the day job um, which was to do with feeding vulnerable people um, and that was done with um, a company, uh, the, the fair share company uh, and looking at, at the ways that the logistics works for um, food distribution so very very important. Um, some statistics um, of what the activity since um, uh, the first study group. Um, there have been 20 different events organised by VCAMS. Um, around about 750 people have taken part in those events. Um, we estimate about three person years from the executive team has gone into putting it all together. Um, and it's led to 20 reports, preprints, uh, UKRI proposals. Um, studentships or submissions directly to uh, policy bodies such as SAGE and I'm pretty happy with that as a number that's come out of, of the um, lockdown period. Um, note on diversity, one of the lovely things about the virtual world is it's a diverse world. Um, whilst the, the numbers of uh, female participants aren't as high as we'd really like, um, a number of uh, people who have caring commitments with families have said that the virtual world has allowed them to participate in a way they wouldn't be able to participate. Um, in terms of mathematical diversity, mostly applied maths, but um, the Harborn Institute uh, took part in some of the study groups, so pure mathematicians are coming along. Pure mathematicians are great at solving problems, uh, say so social science and economics has come across, and in terms of geographic diversity participation from all continents including the um, Antarctica um, and in terms of uh, um, diversity from our community mostly academic uh, but strong uh, participation from business strong participate from government and a few others which will be kind of freelance um, freelance workers and stuff like that um, so let's see where we're going so it, it's all been such a, a furious rush um, but it, and with so little inertia trying to get things done instantly we haven't had a much chance to think about uh, what's going to happen next but now is the time to do that so in terms of activity here are a series of um, activities that are going to be occurring within the next six months 
Uh, and in fact, on Tuesday, I was contacted by Mike Cates, who's head of RAMP, to ask if VCAMs could work with RAMP to run between six and nine virtual study groups over the next year, um, which will be working collaboratively with RAMP. So that's very, very exciting and will give us plenty to do on the next year. And the question, how, how then, and then do we prioritise things? Um, in terms of governments, um, so before lockdown, uh, we had the bond review and a lot of discussion about um, sort of uh, connected centres, uh, National Centre for Impactful Maths, um, uh, Academy for Maths, and, and it's then natural to ask whether VCAMS should transition itself into a unified knowledge exchange structure. And this is something where the IMA will play a critical role um, because of its, its national um, standing in this. Um, and we'd certainly like to extend beyond the core team. There's been very little democracy in setting up the core team. It was just people that wanted to do it, gluing themselves together. But um, we must have a mechanism for uh, being much more inclusive and bringing more people into the core team. Um, and in terms of kind of the way forward, both in governance and activity, um, one question is very important. How do we engage the whole community um, so that um, how can we give opportunities for mathematicians who are not used to KE to do KE? How can we involve people that are not familiar? Um, again, the virtual study group is a great way of doing that because all you need to get involved is to switch on your computer. You don't need to go anywhere. So it helps. Um, the second is um, how do we kind of fund this activity in the future? Should we go for dedicated art UKRI? Should we charge uh, industrialists significant sums of money these are interesting questions um, we've had the philosophy that anything done about covid is pro bono um, how to increase the diversity as i say we've got 30 percent female uh, it'd be much great if we could we could improve that um, and get diversity um, in all ways and my last question is how to involve uh, the ima given where we are so just uh, this is my final slide um, vcams so far has been super inclusive and we want to super include everyone from the IMA. And if you want to get involved, probably easiest is to contact Dawn at the ICMS. As I said, VCAMS wants to provide opportunities for knowledge exchange in both directions, maths to end users, end users to maths, to provide information, problems and training. And I see this is something, again, the IMA can be very, very involved with. Uh, we're happy to help anyone that wants to run a virtual study group or webinar. So if you want to do that, again, just get in touch, probably uh, with Dawn. And if you want to find out more, uh, there is the website. And there's also a Twitter account and uh, um, a, a ton of resources on that website that, that might be of use if you want to do that. So on that, I will finish and hand back to Martine. Martine, are you there? I can't hear. You're, you're, you're still muted, Martine. I, I wasn't quite sure whether I was supposed to do that or whether it would be done for me. But thank you so much, Chris, for an excellent talk. And as somebody who's been at a couple of those study groups, they have been great. And it has been easier for me, I have to say, to be part of them because I don't have to say, can I actually clear three solid days from my diary and travel down and stay somewhere else? Um, and so that has been really, really helpful. Uh, and it's been absolutely fascinating. And, and uh, out of that, I've got some internal consulting from my university about, about various, various matters of interest. Um, so that's been really, really good for me. Um, so you've said a, a lot about how uh, you, you've had increased diversity geographically in terms of, of um, the usual uh, gender split and, and uh, national splits and so on. Um, have you seen more dipping in and out than you would otherwise with a physical one? And, and Really, overall, what are your COVID keeps? What are the things that you've been surprised about or, or, yeah. or enchanted by about the kind of lockdown world that you think you really want to keep a hold of and go forward with? Right. Well, in terms of dipping in and out, yes, um, it, it has made it easier to dip in and out. I mean, I was at the study group last week and combined that with a ton of university business at the same time. Um, and uh, I suppose it's both a plus and a minus. Um, it, it, Yes, the university business got in the way of things a bit, but it also meant that I could go to study group and otherwise might not have been able to do so. COVID keeps. Um, 
the, the, the low inertia of the virtual study group world, that the fact that you can set things up and go for them and run things um, has been really great. And I have been super, super excited by the way that teams of mathematicians really work so effectively together and have gone to war with, against COSID through, through this mechanism. It's been wonderful to see. And the other, of course, COVID T is, is we've learned um, much better how to use the technology. And of course, much of that's been driven by, by um, involving uh, PhD students that, that really know their way around it. So I am very, very keen to continue with this in the post-COVID uh, scenario, um, either everything virtual or, or something hybrid or somewhere in the middle. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm going to invite uh, Ian Phillips to ask his question. Are the team able to uh, unmute uh, in for us? Okay, I need to read them out. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, well, quite a lot of quite a lot of questions from Ian actually. So he starts off with um, he tried to find examples to bring to study groups that never succeeded. What kind of problems does industry raise? I wonder if Ian, given those examples, that question is now answered. I think there were some lovely examples there, but maybe you've got a couple more, Chris. Um, and he, said, he also says a popular concept being banded around is the digital twin. This is modeling as we know it. Is there anything that chems can do, uh, VChems can do to, to bring an understanding of the opportunities and limitations of all models in a way which is understandable by general public and by politicians? Oh, that's an incredibly good question. Um, so the reports that we've written, particularly the ones for SAGE, um, have... Uh, a ton of caveats in each so that people are aware of the limitations of the model. Um, and the facilitators who kind of control the work on each problem are largely people who have a lot of experience in modeling and, and themselves know the dangers and limitations of them. Um, in terms of how we can convey this to policymakers, um, it has to be done honestly. Um, and if anyone's interested, I've actually written a, policy, a document about the, how mathematical modelling works and the pros and cons um, in it. And I noticed that um, um, Naira uh, was on BBC, or I think it was, it was certainly on TV on Sunday answering exactly this problem. It's a problem we all face as mathematical modellers. All models are wrong, but some are still useful. Excellent, excellent. And so uh, the next question is also from Ian. Has anybody tried to tell economists that their equations seldom meet associative, commutative and distributive requirements that allow equations to be explored? Uh, I wouldn't know to that level of detail. Um, economists certainly come along to virtual study groups and uh, we work with economists generally. Um, as regards the equations, I, I wouldn't know without seeing the equations, sorry. <laughs> So do we have any more, any more questions? I think uh, we've, we've uh, run out of the, our, our list. Well, if not, then uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker.